Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sloppy Lab. Uh, this is Bottom of the Beaker, the show all about the design ducks and strategy of Keyforge, everybody's, and I mean everybody's favorite unique card game. I'm JT Russell, and with me tonight is the man who thinks he's 34 hours behind our guest, maybe 57, depending on if it's uh, daylight savings or not. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to check in with them. But of course, I'm talking about Quick Draw three, four, five, seven. Hello, Quick Draw. How are you doing this evening? Hey, I'm great this evening. Thanks for having me back on uh, a second night in a row. Oh, second night in a row. Love it. Uh, man. I had to, yeah, I had to make sure I changed my hoodie just so I didn't. <laughs> uh, I see you got my shirt that I sent from last night right. after the show was over. I, I had, we, we share the shirt, so I had to send it back to you right away. We're actually the in the different rooms in the same studio, <laughs> just <laughs> wardrobe change. But, uh, but yeah, so quick draw, tell us who's in the lab with us tonight, uh, yeah. at least metaphorically, you know. <laughs> We have a very special guest who uh, welcome back to the show. One of our most popular episodes from season one featured none other than Astron, and uh, he's back here this evening. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming back, Astron. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it a lot the first time, and you know, I have some things to say, some things to share, and I'm looking forward to talking with you guys again. As are we. Yeah, this should be a lot of fun. We have a great, uh, great topic teed up. Uh, I, you know, I think we'll be very much a discussion, so this will be exciting. I think it's a, an evolving idea and actually piggybacks off of the uh, topic that you brought last time around that did get lots of lots of really positive feedback. So I'm excited to see where we go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Astron, tell us uh, tell us uh, what you had in mind to chat through. Uh, this was one that you, you had kind of kind of pitched as a as a follow up and, and kind of some with some new new things to, to think on. Um, so, yeah, let's know what you're thinking. Yeah, so for those that didn't uh, listen to the first one, it was about uh, empathy. I encourage you guys to go uh, listen to it, but not empathy as in like the thinking about someone's emotions, but more empathy about in strategy where we look at our opponent's decks and we don't just play our deck as is, but we play our deck that can be proactive against the opponent's deck while also... Uh, just constructing a game plan that can beat their deck at the same time as using our own dex tools for it to get to the win. And so today I wanted to bring up um, the idea of looking at game flow. It builds on from uh, that topic and it looks at the idea of trying to be in control of the game and what are some pinnacle moments that we, or pinnacle decisions that we have been, at least had in front of us in the past that allow us to, that we can talk about now and learn from that can help you guys. And that's pretty much, it's a very broad topic. There's a lot that goes on. Um, part of it is looking at the actual game flow of the game. Another part is looking at how does our mental affect our decision-making. Uh, but ultimately it's really looking at the idea of resource management and trying to not just um, use our resources just because we're in the lead but or even if we are behind but trying to construct a plan to finish the game uh, it's as like JT told me before that in chess the best uh, the hardest game to win is the game that's already won is that what it was mm -hmm. yeah yeah hardest game to win is a one game uh, they're very fond of saying that uh, at least on the coffee chess stream <laughs> just a lot of fun to follow along but absolutely uh, yeah you uh you you get up you get up a piece on your opponent and they start playing like a grandmaster and then you like kick up your heels and you're wondering how you lost a game when you were up by a bishop <laughs> or a knight right <laughs> yeah totally oh man that gives me so many bad memories of games where I'm like yep I'm I'm like eleven points up material and then back back rank checks me and I was like <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I just lost this game totally um, but yeah no that I. I used to have this idea when I played Keyforge for a few years, um, when I was much younger, well, not, I say much younger, <laughs> when I was a little <laughs> younger, um, like in the early days of Keyforge where I used to think my best time that I was playing the game when was, was when I was playing from behind, because I felt like playing from behind was the best, like I had to think about every single tool that I have access to in order to find or solve this puzzle to try and get back into this game. Mm -hmm. 
and I loved being behind. I loved starting off one or two keys behind and just trying to build my way back into the game. It means that sometimes you lose 3-0 because you just don't have those <laughs> tools, but it's just the most rewarding to come back from behind and very uh, distressing when you are ahead by that much and end up losing. And so how can we then um, think about our resources and try to not just run out of gas, run out of steam towards the end of the game? Or how can we use our resources to get us back into the game? That's probably the main point of this today's discussion. So if, if you like, next time we play a league game together, um, I'm happy to manual mode and give myself a key at the beginning of the game. <laughs> if, if you think that'll make the game more fair, I, I'm open to that too. <laughs> I'm not in for uh, handicapping anyone. Um, <laughs> just in general, <laughs> don't think it's the most fair thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I had a game uh, a couple days ago in NKFL that this topic resonates with me because I felt totally in control. I was up 2 0. I had, I think, five Amber and they had, I think, two. You know, it was like it was fully in control. And I was playing one of my strongest decks. I felt absolutely comfortable with it and like kind of using one of the terms we've just used now, like running out of gas or kind of just, you know, maybe I, I went too hard earlier and I ended up losing the game and mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that I lost it. But it was like, it's that exact feeling that you're, you're talking about where, you know, maybe I didn't manage my hands well enough early and then I just ran out of steam. Uh, it's more than just handcrafting though. Like maybe I, I didn't use the cards optimally. Um, I don't have the ability to go back and watch that game again, but I'd love to, because those are the games that I really want to like, figure out like where did this go wrong like wh what could i have done differently you know those kind of things mm -hmm. i do really love this topic because there's the dual nature there's the there's the very sort of technical resource management side of it you know mm -hmm. thinking about what my my paths to victory are what my answers or, or ways to to reestablish my a strong position once their board wide comes right there's there's kind of thinking through all those pieces and there's also this uh there's also the mental side of it which absolutely plays a role right you know not only not only is there a little bit of edge taken off if you start the game down but if you if you walk into a game and you say well gosh i'm 20 a 20 south point underdog i'm just playing this is all gravy like let's let's just make something happen and see what we can do to win it's it almost i don't know and the flip side the flip side right is if you walk into a game and you feel like like, yeah, my deck is just better. I should win. You're almost, it's really hard to resist the pull to just fire every shot that you can fire to, uh, to get to the finish line as quickly as you can. And that's a great way to lose. Uh, it's a great way to lose an advantage, right? If you, if you just kind of pitch your, pitch your board wipes, pitch your, uh, you know, burn that TMTP for a pip early sort of a thing, just cause you know, believing that you have this advantage that can't be blown. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's one of the reasons that. I hate playing my favorite deck, my best deck. Um, <laughs> playing my best deck is one of the most stressful things because, and deservingly, I lost with it two times in a row in the NKFL this season so far. And I'm just a little bit distraught because before that, I went on a 48 or 49 game win streak. And I was just like, I am untouchable with this deck. And then I was definitely uh, in a place where I was no longer untouchable and I was, I lose some, lost some very, very, very distressing games that should have probably been more in my favor than I had initially um, thought. Oh, well, that happens. Hmm. Did you feel like those, those losses came because you, you know, you weren't keeping sight, you know, weren't keeping the game flow in sight. You weren't you know, maybe you felt that the deck was strong enough that you didn't need to be empathetic in your reasoning, per se. Uh, or or just, you know, these losses happen. These things happen, you know. It was definitely my decision making. <laughs> I appreciate the candor. <laughs> there, there was two moments. I remember the two moments that I that I actually lost for those two games. The first, and I'm not trying to do too much anecdotal stuff. That's uh, It's hard to track that, especially if you're not watching it in person sure. and you're listening to it. But... Um, just determining when to, like, there was a moment in one game where I could have just played the board and, or played the most cards in my hand, but I chose to 
steal with a TMTP, but nothing else. And that's great. Stole for four amber, gained five amber total, but then they just went straight up to six again and for the next turn. And I didn't have creature control in my hand, so I couldn't do anything in the next turn. So playing a, un a suboptimal, well, playing what felt like a should have been a suboptimal turn was probably the better play because it meant that I could have saved this resource of a TMTP for later. Because for those that not don't know what TMTP is, that's too much to protect. It can still above six. Uh, and so it's a great card that can slow fast decks down. And so when we have those kind of tools, we can we should be using them to think about towards the end game. A game isn't one in key one or key two, it's one in key three. And so that's one of the biggest things that I think I have recently been not doing well. And I've just been going, well, let's just smash this game as quick as we can. I know my deck's proactive. I know my deck's got so much creature control. What's the point in like, let me just kill this board. It's okay of like two creatures. Yeah, they're two creatures, but they're dead now. So. I'm going to win. And then I realized that I just wasted this really good resource that could have taken out their, their entire deck's plan. If they, if I just wait, waited like one or two more turns. Um, and so, yeah, resource management is huge in Keyforge. Like some, we talk about with new players, when we try to, uh, to play the game, a lot of them hold cards to try and get the best value out of them. Right. And so we teach them, you need to play more cards. And then at a certain point of the game, they've played a lot, at a certain point in their career of Keyforge, I don't know why I said career, but Keyforge <laughs> life, they, um, they, they are now at a point where, like, I can't seem to be getting better. Well, now you're, now you're playing too many cards. You need to hold more cards. And so there's this balance that we need to find of when to hold cards, when to play cards. And it's not just handcrafting for the sake of trying to get the best draw to come forward because that is important handcrafting is massively important but sometimes we just need to hold a card sometimes we need to not hold cards if we hold too many we're not going to get through the deck if we don't hold enough we're going to use all our resources up too quickly and i think that is one of the main ways that we need to, that is important for considering game flow yeah i think another point here like you're talking about holding cards now and handcrafting but you're also talking about tempo like that that tmtp mm. play that you referenced you you feel like you lost tempo because that was the only card you played that turn you got great value for it at the time but you lost the tempo and since they went back to six the next turn you actually could have had a more productive turn to play more lower value cards and then still got that same value out of the tmtp later when it was better integrated into your game flow and your game plan and so you wouldn't have lost like lost that momentum and that flow that you had, right? Mm, no, 100%. And I knew it wasn't a play I should have played. I knew I should have played the other play. Um, I think part of the reason was I <laughs> my game was at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> so <laughs> that was probably... I, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to put excuses because uh, I don't like doing that. Um, but that it was a factor because I definitely found that in that game, in those games I was playing, every decision just felt so difficult. Every decision of when to hold and when to play cards, I'm like, I genuinely don't know what the right play is. And we're not going to know because we don't always know what the draws are going to come to be. But I think we need to think about the way that we the draws are coming. How is, like, what turn am I going to be playing now that if I don't draw the cards that I need, am I going to be screwed? And maybe you should hold one of those cards to ensure that you have that card the mm. next turn, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, tempo is a great word to kind of scratch at what's, what we're getting at with uh, game flow. The other ones that do come to mind, you also mentioned, right? Gas is a BHOC, BHOC favorite turn, uh, term. Uh, you know, the end game often being decided by the person who runs out of gas more, more quickly and has that one less, less one less answer at the end. Um, being mindful of those in the beginning of the game and, and middle game as you're approaching that state is like very important. I also, I also, you know, really think about this in a, 
as analogous to sort of the momentum of the game or you as a person racing to that third key. Um, it's very easy to get into a, a mode of making decisions very greedily, right? Especially when it's when it really relates to the cards in hand and how much you're drawing turn over turn. You know, you can look at it, look at your hand and say, gosh, am I really, am I really just going to play one card, let my opponent crawl back to parity on board, you know, when I could be playing three or four in a different house, uh, you know, going wider and, and, you know, maybe forcing them to make some, some moves, you know, with the other thought being like, there is a, there is a board wipe coming at some point, right? It's very difficult to like get yourself to a point where you can say, no, I'm going to let my, you know, advantage on board diminish uh, for the sake of preserving some of that momentum for the final push of the game. Um, mm. Yeah. The, uh, the deck I have up right now on screen for the folks watching along, I've talked about a number of times uh, on the show, uh, Destrotage, Spawn of the Dragon Tower. I uh, don't want to get into yeah too many specifics, but yeah, it's it's a deck that does revolve around a big TMT play, big TMTP play at some point, uh, with lots of capture and and small scale steel to kind of uh, edge in that. But I bring it up because it's a deck where, when I feel like I'm playing it well, I have lots of quiet turns, right? Lots of turns where I'm playing one card here, one card there, uh, just kind of edging closer and closer to the to the kind of cliff as it were, uh, building up to a board wipe, building up to the TMTP play. Um, and it's a deck that took me a long time to feel like I was playing well because there are a lot of good cards in it and it feels really bad to take a quiet turn when you have big splashy plays in a different house. Um, but I don't know, like, uh, it's sort of this, this trade-off of, uh, of preserving the overall, your overall momentum, your overall, uh, momentum in the race or kind of flow through the game versus, feeling like you're getting, you know, max value from every single play you could possibly make uh, in the moment, which may not necessarily translate to, you know, best overall value across the course of the game or best plays in service of your long-term strategy. Yeah. I'm thinking about threats as well. Like you're talking about setting up this big TMTP play and you're always have that threat looming until you use it. And then as soon as you use it, you lose that threat and that threat i think like you're talking about astron as well in your situation also tmtp but there can be other threats besides just scaling ember control they really can affect your opponent's play negatively and mm. i'm thinking of um the game that i was mentioning earlier man kfl game i have two nature's call in that deck with tons of other creature control and i found myself i, I ran out of gas when i could not redraw back into my nature's calls and I'm thinking now, like, sure, when I played it, I got good value. I bounced three creatures. I got some captured amber back. But if I had just held that, I still could have had that value later at a time when I really needed it. And having that still, like, in my hand or coming up in my deck, they haven't seen that threat yet, I think could really influence how they're playing as well. That doesn't give you that immediate value, like you mentioned, JT, but it is still, like, value that's going to come uh, imminently. Mm, a, a large part of of controlling that game flow is giving your opponents more difficult decisions. The more decisions that's put in front of them, the harder their game is to play, and the more variance there is on what they have to do, what they could do. And so, something that I like to do is if I have a a, a little bit of a board, and they have a bit of a board and we're trying to battle over who gets control of the board, I don't actually always kill all the witches. Mm. <laughs> I don't or I don't have to if I know that by putting out, by leaving them with equal number of houses on board, they have a harder decision on to what the next turn is. Because just because there is a good card on the board doesn't mean it has to die because they may not be able to use it right away anyway. And they may even go into a suboptimal turn to use it just because they want to use it. And I've seen it happen so many times where people are like, there's a great card on board. I have to use it. I have to use it. But it meant that they disrupted their own game flow to do so. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does buy you back. Uh, and it's harder to know 
when that is the right decision. Especially if you go, look, they've just played a bunch of Logos cards. The likelihood that they're going to play a bunch of Logos cards again is low. So if I fight other things and keep Logos boards, Logos creatures on the board, they're probably not going to have a chance to use it. And then occasionally they call Logos again and play four more Logos cards and <laughs> use those Logos creatures. So it doesn't always work, uh, but it's a way we can disrupt, I guess, their game flow on by putting as many decisions in front of them as we possibly can. And that comes from board management. That comes from my favorite cards are bounce cards. I love bouncing cards back to their hand. And I love putting things back on top of their deck because those sorts of cards can, you can just decide exactly what kind of draw they're going to have the next few turns. I love facing Halifest decks so much with the decks that I play. It's really weird. <laughs> it really is weird because, well, Halifest are going to give themselves chains and I often am ready with a board control card, like some sort of board wipe. So if you board wipe right after, if they're not going to get value out of it straight away, then you board wipe, it goes back to the hand. They now have three chains or so and an extra three cards in their hand, meaning if they don't have Brobnar cards in their hand already from the new draw, they're going to have to play another turn just to get those creatures out or they're probably not going to get through the deck very well. Mm -hmm. Love this facing those kinds of decks. Yeah, this is so good. And and there some great questions in the chat too, which you're you're hitting on now. So I want to acknowledge it a, a, a little bit here too. Uh, there was one from uh, from Cloggin. You know, well, you know, when or what signals kind of indicate that a player should change their tempo or try to affect the flow of the game, right? Uh, or even you know, let me try something else instead. And I think a big part of that is, you know, recognizing which player is on the spot to make something happen or, or needs to make something happen that's different to alter the flow to change the outcome of the game, right? Might be, it might be in their Halifax example, like with, with your bounce and disruption, like if, if their plan is just keep going back into Brobnar and unloading those dudes, it's not going to go well for them. Uh, or it might be in the TMTP example, understanding that as the player facing TMTP, I've kind of just got to draw it out so I can burst next turn. So you know what? Take my four amber, take my five amber now. That's fine. I need the freedom to burst ahead for keys two and three, uh, and just and just need to flush it out, you know. Um, and not flushing it out is such an has such a negative impact to my flow downstream that I, I just need to take the hit and make sure that I draw it out now. Um, so I don't know. Re really interesting examples for sure. I think another point with that where clog in is that I try to do this. Once I've got, if I'm ahead and once I got that second key, there's definitely a shift in the game. And we definitely feel that we're getting close to the end game. So both players are starting to think about what they got, what their plan is going forward. And so sometimes what I do in my, once I forge the second key, I can give myself a little bit of time just to think about, okay. I'm getting close, most likely getting close to a reshuffle if my deck isn't super efficient. They're most likely getting close to a reshuffle. How can I think about the cards that I have now and the cards that I could have on the new draw to prepare myself to win this game? Am I just going to burst and go always be checking, get to six as quick as I can? Am I going to try and force a combo turn where I try to get this key charge or some sort of key abduction sorted? If I spend too many resources on that and it doesn't end up happening, does that cost me the game? And so thinking about re-changing your plan, like what is your, once you get to that second key, your game plan is completely different. You're now going, now how can I win this? And so you don't have to be foot on the throttle the entire time you're playing the game. You don't have to be trying to force every single interaction to be in your favor. I think there's this classic example in um, Super Smash Bros where if the opponent has a counter, sometimes I'm going like ham on my combo and then, you know, I know there's a, an opportunity for them to then counter because of the, the frames and whatnot that I just don't press a button. They've countered and now I'm back into my combo again because I didn't get attacked by their counter. And that's something I like to think about when I'm in Keyforge. I'm like, well, they have a risk may have a response to me 
pushing even harder. Let's just take it slow for a second and think about what I'm going to do. You're kind of like getting to a point where this is starting to click for me a little bit too. Like when you talk about flow and you talked about like pivoting to a different game plan, like is this the right game plan for winning the game or did I go all in on the key abduction and, and miss on it? I have some decks that have a few different paths to victory and such an important part of of winning some matchups is understanding when you can go for a data forge play or when you need to play a grindy game or when you need to play a rushy game. And I think a really cool part about this, I think, is um, kind of visualizing and, and having an understanding of what, like, where you need to pivot before you have to get there. And I think that's kind of like what you're hinting, hinting at with the game flow is like understanding, like, yeah, they have this TMTP coming. And so I'm going to play into that by doing something different and kind of being one step ahead of them. And then when it works in your favor, you really like, you feel good about it, right? Like you really feel like you're in the, in the flow. Uh, and so it's like a different definition of it, a different thing that you've been talking about. But I, I think it's totally relevant. Like mentally, it feels great to be like, yeah, I made this amazing play. I predicted what was going to happen three turns ahead. I anticipated them using my empathy of what their deck was trying to do. And you had a plan for it, like to counteract it. It, actually, that reminds me, back when I could play IRL Keyforge, because that's when Australia had, pre-COVID, pre people would play a lot of the game. Um, it was also around the time, maybe it was just after the first lot of COVID, we had KFPL1. And I had a, there's an Australian player who was a friend of mine who I almost saw him as a mentor slash coach for me because I managed to be one of the only players to Australian players to qualify for the first KFPL. And I was like, I don't know how I got here, but I'm here. <laughs> so I need someone to help me. <laughs> and he just said one game we were playing, I think it was like a, you, you had three decks, you picked one at the start of the match and you played adaptive. And he was like, your opponent is going to on about turn seven or turn eight, they're going to play a, they're going to try and go for a gateway, a rise, control the week. All in one go. That's about what their deck should do around turn seven or eight. And then, so he said, you should just hold your punctuated for around turn six. Just hold it for that time and then play it right then. And it worked exactly as he said it. And I was just like, what? How did, <laughs> how did you... How did you know this would happen? And he's like, that's just how that deck wants to play. It wants to get to the certain point, And usually around turn seven or turn eight, it would have enough creatures in the discard pile that it can set up for this combo. And so you just be patient with your punctuated. You don't need to play it. You need to save it for when their deck's plan is about to hit. And you can usually find a by understanding their decks, you can recognize that there's different plans that they can do that is going to win in the game so you need to know how to stop that and prevent that from happening you can also read into like some of their turns right before those kind of combos where like they suspiciously only played one card that that turn you know like they're obviously getting ready to do something like with a library access turn you might see like if they're setting up for big library access the turn before they might go into disc just to play like a single creature and then pass the turn you know or, or a single creature in library of the damned and pass the turn that's when you know there's like an inflection point where they're about to try this and you just need to be a step ahead of them. Mm. Mm. Can I think there's yeah, cool. this whole, the, this kind of reminds me of some nice combos and threats and um, disruption from some winds of exchange decks. Like you think about like, what you can do with the befuddle if you time it well. Like you were talking earlier, Astron, about like, what if I just leave their witch on the board and tempt them to go use it, even though they just called that house twice in a row. And then they do it and you're doing that, like you're baiting them sort of to go into that house and be like, I dare you to call untamed a third time in a row. And then you go into your unfathomable, you kill it and you befuddle them and they can't do anything. And they lose that entire tempo they thought they were gaining from using a witch is gone now and they just lost an entire turn. Hmm. Love that. I loved it. I love those ideas. It's you don't always see them in the games, they don't always pop up. But sometimes you can look for them and when you see them and you're like, okay, I know how I'm gonna win this game. And then execute it flawlessly. Well, not always, but flawlessly and it's just such a satisfying feeling when you know that you have slowed the tempo down in your favor and then the game flow now is yours and you're in control.
Yeah. Feels like there is a lot of stuff in Winds of Exchange. For as much as much crap as I give the set, there is a lot of stuff in Winds of Exchange that lets you kind of control the gameflow, I think, a lot better than previous sets. Totally agree. Totally agree. I don't like the set besides Unfathomable and Mars, but the rest, it exists. It's a set that exists. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I mean, are you thinking mostly of the Unfathomable cards, Quick Draw, or? Uh... I would say largely, yeah. Befuddle, Abyssal Sight, um, Catch and Release, Illusions. Um, I think, you know, things like Closed Door Negotiation can actually be used to really set up a major game flow interruption if you're going to follow it up with an Illusions or a Befuddle. Sure. Because they're going to be like, this is great, I just drew like five more cards. Uh, and they, sure, they gained a lot of Amber and they stole it from me, but I have a huge hand now of 11. I'm going to play six cards from one house. And then next turn, you Befuddle them and you wipe their board, and they literally can't do anything. Sure. So that value they thought they gained from that closed door and drawing those cards is just completely negated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the, the Abyssal Sight and Catch and Release are very interesting to me too, and particularly in in how they can sort of punish, punish you know, handcrafting and some of your flow preservation, um, or at least or what I would call flow preservation, right? So you can definitely find yourself in situations where it, there are diminishing returns on some handcrafting and some uh, some of your long-term planning. And, you know, if there's an abyssal site looming, are you going to hold that punctuated equilibrium for the turn six or seven right before the combo or not? Because uh, they're they're very pos- potentially going to use it to, uh, to, set up, to set up the big turn. So I think it cuts both ways and also and also underscores the main point, which is, you know, you have to be mindful of these things and put on your empathy hat there, right? Uh, mm. And recognize when you actually should take the immediate advantage and maybe be a little bit greedy with some of these things, uh, or at least at least only in so much as you're not putting all of your, all of your eggs in one basket, right? Yeah, totally. Um, I think this, something that's really interesting is that there's definitely a lot of people have put forth that once you get to the high level of Keyforge, the thing that distinguishes the winner on an event is usually the RNG, because where it's such like the decks are so good. Or ma- sorry, RNG and matchup. Like if your deck just better the opponent's deck. Uh, but, and I just can't. I can't put myself in that mindset of of RNG having that much influence. I think there is some times that I've felt in games where uh, there's decisions that come in in front of me where had I made a different decision and for the future draws, I probably could have played the game better. And I don't think there is anybody in this game that is going to play every game perfectly. That is impossible. Otherwise, there's no point in playing because just like give them the trophies and everyone else stop playing like there's no point you need to make sure that we don't just think that rng has a, that much of an influence i just don't i can't fathom that being a thing it's there's i don't know I, so if i can try to help a little bit here i think what you're saying is that yeah there's going to be luck involved right but you need to have a lot of skill to manage that luck or mitigate it or anticipate it and mm-hmm. when you're going to have the luck, when you need the luck, when you don't need the luck and you just need to make a safe play, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think sometimes we make decisions going, well, I know my deck can do this and it does this most games. So I'm going to play it like this because it's going to draw me those cards perfectly and I'm going to be ready for the rest of the game. My game plan is set up from the beginning and I have, I'm not going to bother adjusting as the game goes on because I know my deck does it. It's done it nine out of 10 times. It's not going to possibly be that one out of ten, and if it is, I'm just going to blame my loss on luck. Can't handle that. I do that. I do that way too often, and I still do it way too often. But it's also a pet peeve, even though it's one of the things I have done way too much. My uh, my one rule for myself is to not blame, blame losses on luck, even when I secretly believe you know it's probably what it is. Uh, I'm always looking for the like with the one thing that I could have done better. Um, and I I tend to agree with you. I mean, I think. At the high level, like yeah, there's a lot of people who are making the right decision most of the time, and I think maybe Quick Draw you had said this, but but even still, the difference between folks 
who are making decisions in the 95th percentile versus the 99th percentile, like there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of daylight in there when it comes down to the sorts of decisions that you see uh, in the latter rounds, uh, buying for a top cut or even in the top cut kind of um, kind of a position. Like looking back on my KFC run, like I definitely had some games where I drew very well, and that's probably a big factor in how and why I won. But uh, at least one of the games I lost, I could of the two, right? I can point to a very specific decision that, like, nope, if I was really playing at my best or or had really thought through things well or was considering, you know, the the flow of the game, I probably that was a winnable one. That was a winnable one, and it wasn't just like, oh man, I wish I had done the other thing in hindsight. Like, no, like with the information I had at the time, uh, I think the right decision was achievable. Um, and I mean, that, that happens. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely, well, I guess the counter is like, Hey, maybe you're just not at the top, the top of the player list JT. And that's fair. That's fair. Uh, but I think that, uh, that's a lot more common than folks want to say. And it's just very easy to write those off in luck. But like, that's also the beauty of having a game with variants in it. Like without, without luck to blame, yeah, there's a lot more feel bads to go around. <laughs> right. Yeah. But like, I guess it does feel pretty bad when you lose chess. Because people equate it to, uh, I'm just simply superior to you. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know, I know sometimes, at least with, because I work at a school and the, the kids there, there's definitely this hierarchy of who's the better player and when one of them loses that shouldn't have lost, they're definitely a very sad and get very testy and yeah, don't aren't enjoyable to be around. But yeah, I know I think that's important to have luck in 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 the mind when you're making your decisions. You're not going to draw the things that you want to draw every single game. Your deck's not going to do the same thing every single game. You need to think about what is my turn now? What is my turn in three turns? And what does the end of the game look like? And how can I turn the turn now into a turn that's going to be benefiting me in three turns and then the end of the game? I need to think those things through. And I wonder if we even need to start making a bit of a plan at pregame. So Cloggin made a point about uh, what do you say? He said, going into a game before you have any cards in your hand, can you or do you make a decision about how you want to drive the flow of the game? Mm -hmm. And yes, 100%. I often go, well, what cards do I need to see in my opening hand? Let's think about if I was to get these cards, how would the game look? Or if I don't get these cards, how can I plan myself into a way that the game's going to become my game to control? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and the really interesting ones too are you know you identify cards or interactions that are going to be key to the end game but you draw them within your first hand or two and it's like am i gonna do i have time can i chain myself the whole game can i can i play it now discard it now and, and then hope to redraw it and how does that play out uh, those those get very interesting and i think can be very very skill testing for sure Kind of reminds me, I was talking to Sky Jedi at KFC a few weeks ago, and um, he said that one of the large things they were trying to go for with Grim Reminders was changing how players perceive holding cards. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I think in the past, we we're always like, I just got to cycle my deck and reshuffle my deck. And they were designing Grim Reminders to keep in mind, like, maybe you don't want to just cycle your cards, play them as fast as you can. Maybe you do want to hold more things deliberately knowing that there's so much discard pile manipulation and that your opponent can manipulate the discard pile and you're not going to get that chance to shuffle like you want to shuffle all the time. And it might be better to hold cards for the right time. And so I'm kind of excited to play more of the Grim Reminders for that reason, because it does sound... And it felt like this too in the games that I played the Grim Reminders at KFC. It definitely... I could feel this. And he mentioned this to me after I'd played those games and it really... It kind of made sense. I was like, yeah, like I, I could definitely feel that. It came through in the games that I played. I've been super excited for that set. I in, have played a couple of other card games in somewhat competitive, like I've won a tournaments for things. And nine out of 10 times, the decks that I like to pick up, are, well, there's two different kinds of decks. One kind of deck is graveyard decks. So decks that just kind of recur 
lots of things and you just dump things on top of your deck and then bring it all back and that's just so fun to do and then the other kind of strategy is ones where you hurt yourself in order to get benefits so um if you don't if, um, if you know anything about flesh and blood there is a hero uh hero is it called heroes what are they called heroes I don't know. heroes I don't archons they're called archons yeah archons right? now um, <laughs> There's a character that you essentially purge things, but these cards can be played from the purge pile. And if they're left there, you get damage dealt to you. So you have to, like, it's like slowly burning yourself, but you're getting benefits from it in the long term. Hmm. And so that's the kind of game I like to play in like those two kinds of games. Ones where you just want to dump your things into your discard pile and then try to do things from there and use your discard pile as like a second hand or things where you hurt yourself in order to gain the benefits or you take a slower turn in order to gain benefits like in Keyforge. Sometimes those decks can be a lot of fun because you want to slowly get yourself into a shape, yourself into a game state that's really fun. And that's why I was really disappointed when Woe came out because my favorite deck that I like to play was a flood deck that could keep coming back with recursion. And it was fine. It was a great deck. And it's not necessarily that Woe beats it or because they tend to like your opponent having small creatures. But the decks that beat Woe also beat my deck. And so <laughs> I'm already having a tough time with Woe. And then I'm having an even more tough time facing the decks that are also good against Woe. And I'm just like, I wish this deck, this meta didn't happen this way because I just want to play my game where I'm I build a board, they kill it, I slowly bring it back, kill the board, bring it, and then eventually I purged away their board control and I've gotten myself to a game state where I cannot lose. Mm -hmm. And I love those kinds of decks. Um yeah, no, they're definitely it's great. And I'm so sad that Woe came out. <laughs> <laughs> well the pendulum the pendulum will swing. Uh we'll see. We'll see what Grim Reminders does to the to the Woe meta as it were. Um but I mean I I, I definitely appreciate the and to generalize from your points like there's this like idea of resource exchanges and using kind of non-standard re resources uh yeah life as a resource from the chat and from the mtg world is definitely a thing that that we think on and you know your graveyard as a resource is not really something that we've explored a ton of outside of specific cards like glimmer uh or you know exhume per se but as more of like a, a first class resource um and well, well, we'll see. One that's often abused in games, right? Uh, definitely in the MTG world, uh, you can see lots of abuse from graveyard as a resource. But I think it's cool that, uh, that I really think it's cool that they're putting so much emphasis on challenging notions that we've had about the game or held as as certain. And I, I know we mentioned this uh, last night or a week ago, for, depending on when you're listening or watching. Um, with some of our bad card discussion or design discussion, like I really love strange ordination because it forces you to really like on the nose, like is three chains worth three Amber? Like no, no other questions. This is like, like, are you, are you willing to exchange cards for Amber now? Um, and I will see, we'll see something similar, like with, uh, with Grim Reminders, not necessarily cards for Amber, but challenging a uh, long held notion of like, whether or not you should be holding cards or pitching them, you know? And I, I like that they're kind of in this mindset of helping you like peel back layers of assumptions that you have about how the game operates um, and kind of forcing you to explore those, which is really cool. So then let me put something forward. Do you think that Grim Reminders is going to just not destroy but distort our idea of game flow because our resources are no longer are less limited than they were before i think it's too soon to say um no i don't think it's going to though i think it's just going to change it's going to make it different there's going to be different ways of utilizing the game flow i think when you have different opportunities that are presenting themselves to you like if there's a till the earth is a untamed action that I think is really interesting where it just says both players shuffle their discard piles into their deck. And in the context of grim reminders, that could be devastating or it could be, you know, like massive disruption uh, or it could just be a discard, you know, like in recognizing those situations of what, which one of those things you're trying to use it as, like, are you trying to get your opponent off of haunted? Are you trying to turn off their exhumes and infernus engine that they have going? Or are you just discarding that because you need to stay haunted yourself? 
I think, I think it's kind of related, you know, like there's going to be cards like that, that you have to make a decision. Like, am I going to lose my game flow because of this? Or am I going to kind of set them back enough? I, I just think they're going to be different ways of manipulating this. It's not going to necessarily mm. just be as simple as like holding my TMTP threat. I think there's going to be more layers to the conversation. But it's like you're gonna you can play a board wipe and then immediately archive it from your discard pile. Yeah, <laughs> some of the stuff's crazy, right? Like, like I know that's on a very simple level, and we don't know necessarily how this set like plays as a whole with the other sets involved. And I haven't played it outside of I was a play tester for it, um, so I can't really give too much of what I experienced other than I enjoyed playing it. And yeah, it's something like it's a, it reminds me actually what it reminds me of is my one of my favorite board wipes is key to disc. Key to disc, and then this doesn't sound quite sound like it's in the same ballpark, but key to disc has this ability to just sit there and you don't have to hit it ever. You never have to use it because that means that they have to think about, well, am I going to play a bunch of resources now, my creatures, and then it just all gets blown up. And I remember Aviator was talking to me about one of the games last season where he's like, I was just, I was trying to think about around playing around that key to this because you just left it there and I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know how to, like what I was supposed to do going forward. Like it meant that I, he didn't play as much board. It meant that his game flow was out and I just waited because I'm like, I'm just going to save it because he didn't have artifact control. So I just saved it for when I had a couple of brands and then just went, well, now I'll use it. You've just played board. <laughs> Here's some brands. Boom. Uh, now I have your Amber and all your board is gone. And so just patience. And I love the patience of Kitty Disc. It's such a fun card. Unless they have artifact control, then it's more like, I need to play this as, and use it as quick as I can. <laughs> That's how I feel with Life Word. Hmm. Mm. You just want to like squeeze that life word in before they find their poltergeist. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, lo I love these cards though. It's the uh, it's this sort of like only way out is through uh, when you when you're posed with them as a threat and when you see folks pose with that decision and decide to try they decide to try and go around as opposed to going through. That's when they can really get into trouble. You know, uh, man, I had had a had a game very 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 recently where i was facing uh two copies of uh mars needs amber and like i still have to go to check i've got a ton of i've got a ton of damaged creatures but i still have to go to check otherwise they just sit on those cards and never play them and what am i going to do never check for another key for the rest of the game uh that's not an option um so you know you have to like you have to push through some of these things and key to this is the same sort of thing until you force it to be used, it's just going to be a stone, a stone in uh, in your momentum, you know, your shoe as you're running the race, as it were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's I like interesting. It. I like it. Um, well, I I want to I want to uh, make sure we had a couple of other questions too. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, both kind of the uh, strategic side, you know, the, the tactical side, as it were. Uh, of game flow and also a little bit on the uh the kind of mental side um, maybe swinging back to the mental side do you, you know this is a question that that we had in our kind of our notes like do you have any pre-game rituals or mid-game rituals even that you do to make sure that you know mentally you're uh you're in the zone or as much in the zone as you can be um yeah i'll i'll, I'll, I'll pause it there uh, i asked you a related question quick draw a, a couple weeks ago about but i'll i'll just foreshadow i don't know <laughs> yeah uh or, or just leave it out there i mean we uh we were talking about what were we talking about uh visualization and computation right mm, i like that episode yeah that was fun and I, I asked once quick draw if you had any uh if you had any kind of rituals that uh or uh like a, like a rigid thought process that you go through in order to make sure you're calculating kind of correctly or visualizing correctly, uh, turn over turn. And, uh, and I, I think you were said like, not particularly, you know, kind of, kind of just, just kind of go through it, um, shoot from the hip as it were. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, if you think of, you know, the baseball player who like touches their wrist and their elbow six times before going to bat, there are like things you can do to make sure that you're like, 
make sure that you're not missing things or at least putting yourself in a mindset to be as, uh, I don't know, as in the flow as possible or as in the zone as possible. Um, I don't know. Are, are there other things that you, you all do or, or not particularly? Set up my stream. Set up your stream. <laughs> Is that like yeah, a, actually um, a ritualistic yeah. thing or? Yeah. It, well, I used to have some rituals. Like I used to do some things and I had the same playlist that I, because I used to get really stressed whenever I played competitive Keyforge games, really mm. stressed. Um, and almost to the point of like, like shaking partway through or even like towards the end of the game, just realize I haven't been breathing for a little bit because I just won the game. And so something that I guess has distracted me is by, by streaming, I have, I think I have to get all this stuff set up before the game. So I don't have time to think about it too much. And then I can, if I've given myself enough time, I have the chance to, to look over the decks and talk the decks out loud. I am a, I talk, when I talk out loud, that's how I think, well, try to organize my thoughts. And so it's easier for me to, by talking out loud, and even if it's not a conversation, I'm still processing what's going on on their decks and what is going on with my deck and what I can do to win this match. It's a much, um, it was very, I used to do something similar when I didn't stream not necessarily talk out loud, but just um, would spend a couple of minutes just before the game, just looking over the two decks and going, okay, how does this card interact with this card? What can I do to set up a plan? At what point of the game do I think that they're going to start to really try to take control? Can I try to uh, disrupt that in some way? Am I the proactive deck in this situation? If I'm not the proactive deck, which cards are going to be my most important cards that I need to mulligan for first. And just going through the motions of what is Keyforge and what is it with these two decks. I don't always do it. I don't always do it well because sometimes you don't have time. You just want to play the game. Um, but I think that getting yourself into a zone is really important. Getting yourself, you're mentally checked in because if you're not in the zone, you tend, at least for me, I get tilted really easily. And I'm trying my best through each stream to get better at that. But if I'm not in the zone, I'm not listening to my favorite album of all time, then I'm, it's harder. It's much harder. What is, uh, what's your favorite album of all time? Yeah, uh, the band the is called Nothing But Thieves. Hmm. And the... I like the, both their main um, albums, Broken Machine and Moral Panic. I'm very I'd glad say, you did not say King Gizzard and the Wizard Wizard. Say say what? They're an Australian <laughs> band. I thought I was like, I'm sure that he, he knows who these guys are, but apparently not. <laughs> my, my brothers are obsessed with them. And I was like, he's going to drop a King Gizzard reference right now, isn't he? Thank God. Uh, yep, no idea. I'm, All right. I don't know Good. where knowledge genre. Nothing but these is a... Indie rock. Okay. okay. I guess King Lizard, King Gizzard probably are too. Are you I don't making know stuff up quick draw over there? I, I, <laughs> I, I, listen, I, I give my brothers crap all the time over this band and their name specifically. Mm -hmm. And I was just terrified that you were going to name them Ashron. I was like, please don't, <laughs> please don't name this Australian band. Um, but you didn't. So kudos to you. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I, I don't know if I, I have some, I guess, uh, some, some rituals in this sense. Like I definitely use the two minutes, two to five minutes or whatever it is, uh, at the start of a game to review a list as sort of a settling moment and try to be very, very intentional about imagining how the game's going to play out, identifying like, uh, key combos or not, not necessarily key combos, but key cards at different points, points in the game. Like th that's borderline ritualistic for me. Uh, at the start of a game and I think tends to be helpful and a mid game I, I do try to also have like like a pause moment to reflect before taking any actions because I I don't know we, we all we're all there from time to time playing a, a random comp game on TCO you're in like junk food key forge mode key forge <laughs> mode and you're just like I'm gonna like do the greedy thing every time and just see what happens and those are usually when 
they're uh, racking up the L's, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. But it, but it's it's it takes effort to play well. <laughs> I guess that's obvious. Um, but I agree. It, but yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's worth it to also take those few minutes at the start of the game and a few moments at the start of each turn for settling or or whatever your ritual happens to be. Um, but putting yourself in a mindset where you're in a place to make good decisions or feel feel good about your decisions. Totally. I was going to say I didn't have any rituals, but now that you mention it, in IRL Keyforge, I definitely have more. Like I'll do a six-pile shuffle mm -hmm. um, and kind of like reorder the piles the same way and do some regular regular shuffling with that. Definitely like to take a full like focus two minutes in the Archon card. But online, I don't really have any of that. Archon, it's like get my coffee, close my door, <laughs> and like <laughs> just make sure I'm ready to go. Like not really much more than that. Um, yeah, but I, I just like you, Astron, I get I get very nervous as well for those competitive games. Definitely do some pacing mid game sometimes. Some pacing mid game, I like that. I have a a disadvantage IRL because one of the things that I do, even when not streaming, is I'll like talk out my turns out loud, like just be sitting there at my desk talking out my ideas, you know, doing the uh, the rubber duck debugging, you know, finding my finding the bugs in my decision making, um, uh, which I'm not gonna do uh, IRL. Uh, I mean, Beehawk does it IRL, but uh... I was just going to mention Beehawk. He told us some funny stories. <laughs> he has yeah. a tendency to just kind of like talk out loud about what his opponent should do. And he said he's gotten himself into a few situations where his opponent's like, actually, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. That's, I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Well, I don't know. I mean, this is a bit, this has been great. Uh, we're, we're just past the hour. I don't know. Uh, let's see if we had any other, any other big topics or thoughts we wanted to hit um before moving on no um i guess it's kind of it hey let's i feel like we've covered a lot of really good points to do with game flow we may not have necessarily talked as heavy on mental but it's definitely something to think about. Like when you're not mentally in it, you're going to make, you're going to find the decision points much harder, much more difficult. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if but that's a story. It can be a whole thing on its own, a whole episode of just talking about how to mentally get into it and how to not be, get just tilted. I'm probably not the best person to, to be the expert on that because i i definitely struggle with some of those uh concepts but i know that at least at the end of every game that i play every stream game when i'm talking to the chat i go okay what did i do that it could be improved even if i win i still say yeah i won that game but i'm sure i could have improved on what i did so what can and i think that's important to do in every game is to just reflect 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 what is the purpose of learning if you're not going to reflect on the games you played? Yeah, hundred percent. Totally agree with that. That's something that I really, um, that's why I appreciate having you on. Like having that mindset, I think is so important. We always try to talk about like ways to learn and get better. And I think that's such an important part is that to not blame luck, but to just say like, what did I do wrong that game? You know, like, sure. Like I just ranted for five minutes about how I had the worst draws of all time. And I lost the game, but like, okay, I'm I'm done venting. Let's be real. Like, what could I have done differently to prevent that? I, I love that approach to it, and I think everyone should have that same same kind of aspect of a game after you uh, win or lose. I have this philosophy that I uh, whenever I get to a brick wall in my learning, and that if I don't feel like I'm progressing, I try to reset myself in my expertise and go. You know what? I actually going to look at this and go, I don't know anything about this. Let's look at the fundamentals from again and go from there. And how can we move, keep moving forward? And so I'll often go back and listen to many people's podcasts. That's why we have this information out here so that we can just talk about what, like about the game and often, very often, and I don't just do this in Keyforge, I do this in a lot of things. If I'm struggling to keep learning, I want to, I always try to go back and go, okay, 
let's look at the fundamentals and let's build from there and try it and see what happens. And every single time I've tried to do this, I have excelled further than I was before when I had gotten to that brick wall. Yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of brick walls. Um, I mean, I, I know JT's trying to wrap this up, go to bed, but there, it's interesting that you mentioned the brick walls because another thing you mentioned earlier, JT, is how the difference between like the 95th and the 99th percentile, um, that's a concept that I actually, I think I got it from now in stereo for the first time where he talked about how it's pretty easy to go from zero to like 70% in Keyforge. And there's like a bit of a wall at 70. And then to go from like 70 to 90 is like, you know, once you get over that 70 pump, it's fairly easy to like keep progressing to the point you get to 90, but then like that last few brick walls that you hit 90 to 91, 91 to 92, et cetera, like those are really hard to surpass. And I think that's why you see such a difference between like the top tables, like Ashron, you're talking about, you know, like people think that, Oh, well, everyone at the top tables is skilled and it just comes down to luck, but no, like there's a lot of difference in skill between someone who is, playing 99% efficient and someone that's playing 97% efficient. Like those can definitely be difference makers in this game. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts, JT? Just <laughs> uh, been li listening calmly. No, I, I like it. Absolutely. I, uh, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> honestly, I was thinking, uh, at Aspera, per Aspera, I don't know. <laughs> per Aspera, at Astra. Uh, the red rising folks know what I'm talking about, but yeah, to the, to the stars as it were, but yeah, a hundred percent, the last, the last few percentage or percentile points of efficiency are really hard to really hard to achieve. And that's where, I mean, frankly, a lot of those games are decided, um, when they're decided by skill, certainly. So it's tough. It's tough to say, um, how much, how much it takes to get them, but it's a lot, it's a lot. I don't know. I don't know. I have work to do. I know that much. <laughs> it does. Everyone does. Yeah. yeah, everyone does. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, and a lot of names come down to one hammer. Yeah, some some great great thoughts from the chat here too that we, we've been neglecting. But yeah, so many games where you, you come down to one amber and you just like imagine all of the decisions that were one amber difference makers yeah. um, uh, throughout. And it's, I mean. The, totally the, true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Those are achievable by the last, last few percentage points. You know, you, you shrug off like, a, Ooh, that was a, that should have been a, a reap instead of a fight or a fight instead of a reap. Um, I mean, those are, those are often worth at least an amber. Um, and so many that come down to the one. And even if it's not like, Oh, I lost by one amber. There are, there are plenty of turns where, you know, getting to that sixth amber is is so important that it drives you out of uh, out of one to one house into another house, right? Like like, mm. and then those those differences make a big impact. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, like Z says. Sorry, before that, it's like Z says. <laughs> Key Forge is a game of losing. At least half the time. Yeah. You know. Well, like, sorry. By that, I mean well, he meant your decision points. Every decision point. For the top level, every decision point is a decision of losing. Like if you, not necessarily you choosing to lose, but the player with the fewer mistakes tends to win the game. Mm. And so you mean this is this is two players seeing, you know, which who blunders first as opposed to uh, who can who can re you know it's not who reaches the bar it's who's going to like trip, sort of, as it were, yeah. Interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but you know, it's very much, very much chess analogous, right? I mean, you can only go down from a perfect game. It's not like you're going to mm. score ten more runs. Like, no, you just keep playing, keep making perfect decisions until eventually someone, someone doesn't. Uh, you know, at the that's not the perfect street. game. Obviously, that doesn't no. always work. <laughs> no, not not. I mean, yeah, uh, hyperbole, but yeah, uh, yeah. Interesting. Well, speaking of brick walls, I think we hit. I think we hit it. <laughs> oh, so maybe we'll want to hear a word from our sponsor. I don't know. I think we do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a we have a juicy one this evening. Um, I feel like we've had a lot of uh, there's just a lot of uh, food 
aligned sponsors that we've had. It must be something about our show that's really attracting the the foodies, the <laughs> the foodies in the in the crucible. Uh, but this one is actually sponsored by uh, Slimy Beef Jerky. Uh, so you've got to try some Slimy Beef Jerky, the Crucible's favorite oh snack <laughs> that's forging a new flavor frontier. Crafted with precision, savory and slimy collide in each chewy strip. Grab your decks and grab your appetite because with Slimy Beef Jerky, flavor is forged three keys at a time and every bite is a legendary adventure. Indeed. Have you guys tried slimy beef jerky? I don't know. You got to give it a shot. No, no. <laughs> We've had vegetarian? kangaroo kangaroo jerky, but <laughs> have you had kangaroo beef jerky? Yeah, it's great. It's very, oh, very. Um, what's the word we use? Gamey. Yeah, probably robust. It's very, it's a very rich flavor. Very rich. Think about beef, and then just add a bit more depth to it. Hmm. Interesting. Hey, have you had venison jerky before? I have not. <clears throat> Can't say that I have. I don't eat. I honestly don't eat a ton of meat, uh, though. I will eat beef jerky. I will say I will eat beef jerky, but I've not tried venison jerky. Um, actually, Astron, how many jars of Vegemite do you have in your house at this moment? None. You're a dirty liar. You're a dirty. Liar. I, don't, I don't eat. I don't like Vegemite. <laughs> if we I turn mean, the like, camera I mean, around, we'll I'll see eat jars it. of Vegemite. I'll eat it on a slice of toast, but it has to have like half a kilo of butter. <laughs> Nice. Okay, I'm getting, call- I'm getting called out in the chat. Is it, was that a racist question? If it was, I apologize for my <laughs> ignorance. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's not a racist comment, but people have referred to Indigenous Australians as Vegemite. Really? Mm. As, a word, as a term for the people? As a t- racist, race, racial slur. It's like a racial slur. I did not know that. I learned something. But it's like an older term, and people haven't heard it in a while, so it's like... No one really, it's not. So don't worry. Don't stress. It's okay. Well, he's going to have it fixed by the producer in post. So. Yeah, no, I don't like, I don't like um, Vegemite all that much. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried it. I've never tried it. It's but I've... really, really, really salty and umami flavored. So it's like, if you have a little bit, with a large slather of butter on some toast, it can it can go all right. But if I'm gonna, yeah, no thanks. Interesting. I've only heard people rave about it. You're the first person who That's... I've ever said say that it's not good. Yeah, but like mm. they were grow I... they grew up wrong. I literally just had a conversation about this like two days ago with some friends, and uh, the comments about Vegemite were not good. Interesting. I um... yeah. Yeah, over over the holiday, I got to spend some time with uh, uh, my brother in law. Who there's a different there's a different type of mite. That the, yeah, marmite. Uh, marmite. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I, it also sounds made up to me, but they they were a big fan of marmite, but not vegemite. It's more sugar in it. Interesting. It's, yeah, much sweeter. That's nicer. I like it more. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with like vegemite, it still annoys me whenever I see like videos of people eating it. Cause I just grab it with a big spoon and then lick it. I'm like, no, it's not like, even though I don't like it, it's still not how you're supposed to eat it. You're meant to eat it a very <laughs> small amounts on a nice slather of buttered toast. Marmite is made from marmots. Data for stream. They, I mean, marmite we got the facts right here. <clears throat> marmots. Mm-hmm. What is marmot? I think they're, animal. they're related oh. to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's an animal that's uh yeah uh um, Any, anyway like, uh, we're uh we're derailing uh, i should probably let the folks know that uh bottom of the beaker is recorded live right here twitch.tv slash sloppy lab work uh tuesday evenings typically 9 30 eastern uh you can find recordings of our past shows and other streams over at youtube.com search for at sloppy lab work over there and for the very best content uh 34 no, no, 57 times distilled and scrape from the bottom of the beaker. You can search for that very phrase in your podcatcher of choice. And we'll be there ready to share a spoonful of Vegemite with you. Uh, <laughs> find all that more at sloppylabwork.com. Thanks very much, Astron, for joining us again. Uh, it was a pleasure no to have you on. Yeah. And quick draw. Any words for the folks getting off the final audio stop? Just want to say thanks to Astron as well. Always fun to have you on. Thanks for coming back. And everyone listening, stay sloppy. Stay sloppy indeed. Excellent. 
And um, ooh, Data Forge Stream saying you can technically lose a perfect game in baseball. Uh huh. That is true now. Thanks, Rob Manfred. So I've played a lot of baseball. Uh, fun fact I've played a lot of baseball. How do you lose a perfect game in baseball? Well, as of about two years ago, maybe Data Forge Stream has a different method, but this is uh, they added an extra inning runner to second base to start extra innings to make games go faster Um, because apparently 18 inning games are a bad thing now i think they're lots of fun so what they do is in the 10th inning and on you start the inning with the last batter who was out from the previous inning on second base with nobody out and so you can have a perfect game through nine innings zero Mm. zero and then you start the 10th inning with a runner on second and you hit two sacrifice flies and you allow a run and you lose without letting anyone on base as the pitcher. Wow. I have never played a game of baseball where that was a rule, um, but I burned out pretty hard many it's, years before, yeah. two years ago. So it's, it's a brand new rule. It's terrible. Um, Data Forge Stream, I have thought about this a lot. I cannot wait for someone to lose a perfect game because of that. And I want <laughs> that rule to be abolished. So I can't wait for that to happen. It cannot happen soon enough. Okay. It's a, out of my um, depth, I have no idea about baseball. Is there a perfect game equivalent in, uh, I don't know, what's what's your favorite sport? My I favorite want, sport? I'm going to say cricket, I mean, but I'm going to get called out for being a racist again. <laughs> Cricket's so long. It's so boring. <laughs> um, I am a, I have grown up my entire life playing football, soccer, and I have in the last few years realized that I prefer basketball. So even though I've been playing it for like football for, 15 years or so Mm. um basketball is just it's a great sport and so i have been watching pretty much the nba every single day since wow Wow. right on right on jt i could tell that you could not remember the name of nomar garcia para earlier i i wasn't sure who would who would know who nomar was and so i was like i'll just i'll just go generic baseball player who takes five minutes Nice try. T- I know there. you forgot his name too. <laughs> I don't. I don't follow professional sports. Have I? I've, I'm sure I've told my like I don't follow professional sports stories before. So you know. just follow squash. That's all. I don't even follow professional squash. I. Uh, I mentioned. I'm, uh, this is this is a silly story. This is the this is the after after recording you know, stories that you all stick around for. Um, I I was once uh, teaching uh, teaching a young student. Uh, homeschooling them in computer science a uh, very very well off uh, student and uh, they had a house guest who I had a very nice conversation with uh, and then you know they were they were pretty athletic and you know I am a, a ultimate frisbee was ultimate frisbee captain at the time and needed some more bodies I was like hey you know you look you look athletic you want to come out and play some some frisbee with us they're like no I'm gonna pass I found out later that it was Tom Brady that I had been talking to and invited to play uh, Ultimate Frisbee with me. And uh, I had no idea. No idea. So, See, yeah. if you knew who it was, you never would have invited him to play Frisbee. Maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, that is, any- like, <laughs> okay, for context, it's the only NFL player I know. So <laughs> for someone to be that famous and you just passed up the opportunity... Losses on him was a great frisbee game. So, <laughs> in all history of NFL, I don't know a single player besides Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah. There you There's go. so much non-Americans keep up. <laughs> yeah, you, might, American might, you might have one more on me, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, we should play a game. Let's play a game. Uh, actually, we have a we have a pending tournament game uh, to play Astron. Uh, don't know who that is sorry Coggin. let's see travis kelch he's a swing kelch. <laughs> who's travis kelch? Uh, i don't know <laughs> do you know who taylor swift is i know who taylor sure. swift is not personally I mean, like least. tom brady you know <laughs> this is why everyone knows who travis kelsey is now is oh kelsey see i didn't even say the name right <laughs> yeah, exactly uh because he's dating taylor swift now and so everybody knows who travis kelsey is now yeah man, i don't keep up with famous people hmm I've They're irrelevant other, to me. I've one other one other football player I met, but I think it's a little bit more esoteric. Ray Lewis is that name that rings bells? 
Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Hopefully. Yeah. At, uh, at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, met Ray Lewis. It was, it was fun. So I know many NBA players. <laughs> nice. But nice. I do not know anyone from NFL. And I think the extent of my baseball knowledge is Babe Ruth. <laughs> there you go. That's a good one. That's a good one. And now, as of today, no more Garcia Parra. So, <laughs> although no, no, sorry, my other extent of uh, baseball knowledge is Moneyball. Ah, oh, yeah, good film. Yeah. All right, Moneyball is a good one. There's a lot of a lot of good key forge in there. Uh, or I would also accept why AOA is the best set. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> slash DT. DT is probably a Moneyball set as well. I think you could make an argument for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of you guys is avoiding talking about this match that you have yeah. to play. I don't want to play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we got to rumble. Are you? You can concede, I, I guess. No, I <laughs> no. <laughs> nice. Well, I am playing. I'm gonna play a Russell namesake deck, and I think I'm claiming quick draw as my accomplice as long as the league commissioner doesn't object. Uh, to yeah. this being an official is, match <laughs> does the league commissioner allow for hand and brain to be used for the final <laughs> tournament game for villains of tyranny beat everyone i mean beat everyone there are more okay. people in this game to be beaten you know so. so if i beat both of them do i get two points you already got your point for beating me if i get if i beat both of them now do i get an extra point <laughs> there's uh, a point in the level yeah. at least yeah yes we'll do this he says the only rule is to beat everyone, so we can do whatever we want. Um, I can look at your hand and tell him what's in your hand. It doesn't matter because there's only one rule. Let's beat everyone. Yep, let's do it. Uh, so I have to pick a Russell deck that I haven't played yet. Um, I think I'm going to play this a Russell be, the Barter. This is <clears throat> going to kind of break tradition a little bit, which is fine. We can do this. But normally we have the hand as the person who does not own the deck. So this will be the first time we're going to go the other way around. Do you want to be the hand? You can. You can. No, no. Game. This is your tournament game. I guess that's true. I mean, I will. I will. I will point you again to the rules. <laughs> <laughs> Beat everyone. Yeah. All right. No, be the brain. Quick draw. This will be great. Uh, so. Okay. While Astron's selecting a deck, I'll give you the rundown. Oh, I got my deck sorted. I'm just playing the same one I played in every other game. Okay. Uh, so this will be interesting, and by interesting I mean we may we may sleep quickly. <laughs> Quick draw. <laughs> we'll see. All right, I'm going to start up a new game uh, in competitive. This is be very competitive. Uh, password sloppy. Uh, let's see. And Russell the bartering has some teeth. It is a deck with some teeth. Oh, I didn't make the game it? with hands say, visible. Did you, did you no. turn hands on? Oh, yeah. okay. Remaking. All right. I got to figure out what's in this deck so I can understand what JT is trying to accomplish here with some empathy. I really wanted Ooh. this deck to be my go-to adaptive deck for the name, Russell the Bartering, uh, but I, I don't know. haven't been gravitating towards it. Uh it's got, what does it have in it? It's got a really cool Senator Brackus and a bunch of uh, uh, capture slash exalting stuff uh, with okay. Citizen Trixes, a couple of Fausts. It's got Triple Stirring Grave with Infernus, which is pretty cool. Got an Orb of Wonder. It's got some fun stuff going on. It's got some teeth. Sounds <clears> good. Very All cool. Right. Game's up. And I Playing will... AOA, best set. AOA best set. All right. Yes. Thorbjorg. How do you pronounce that? Thorbjorg? Thorbjorg. Like, Thorbjorg. Nice. Yeah, what's... Well, um, like the Russian. Not Russian. <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell the NKFLers. I don't know. We're not going to tell the NKFLers that you said that, though. Now who's racist? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Yeah, this yeah. deck with Double Brend. Double Brend. This is the deck I was talking about before. Double Brend with your uh, key to this. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, very spicy. I like it. Okay, cool. Uh, quick draw, you've got the Mulligan Decisions. Oh, I'll turn your stream off. <laughs> 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 I was like, ah, oh, 
I wonder. What <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just used to that. Yeah, I'm gonna. Um, I'm gonna say, keep it. Final answer. Yeah, I mean, clearly you don't want me to do that, but I just. Did oh it. no! I mean, you just sounded. You sounded unsettled. Uh, you well, know. first turn Eureka is rough. Um, unsettled because I don't like to mulligan as the second player. Um, mm. And this seems like an adequate starting hand. Um, and so I didn't want to throw it back, you know, and get something that's possibly worse. I had a lot of creature control in my first hand. And although that's usually fine, it is not so fine if you want to win a game. <laughs> well, you have a lot of creature control in general, I would say does indeed pretty good amount at least um uh, i'll go dis here dis it is we're just gonna make some amber then i think play this stirring grave waking nightmare and a relentless creeper cool okay we'll get some dis into this dis indeed okay nice all right um let's go sanctum let's go sanctum okay mm-hmm 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 uh, Harlan Mylock takes flank creatures, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Do I want the extra capture? I don't think I mind this. So I'm going to forego that. Shoot your gub with an amber uh, damage pip from my bulwark, and I'm going to play Mantle of the Zealot on the bulwark here. Okay, okay. I'm gonna get yeah. this again. You would. Archives. Okay. We'll bounce a few things. Mm -hmm. Seems good. And archive the card. Yeah, it's pretty solid. Um. I was hoping you wouldn't go back to this again, because that's where most of your creature control is. I can do it again if you'd like. No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't. He could. He just might. Three archives, he, he the could. library of the damn rolling. Oofa doofa. Mm -hmm. um, let's do Saurian. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Play this duder. Ooh. Gonna steal one. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna exalt. What? But dust him. I know. I, I, I thought about it. Like we're joking, but I did think about it. Um, I don't know. Do you I think was, I should have smashed the dust in quick draw? No, no. I was actually wondering if maybe you do it on the charrette, but to put three, to three on there. Yeah. 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 I think I it's, it would have been a bit. Eh, Wee. A little too Let's cute. Fast. 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 Oofa doofa. I'm sure that the uh Oof. Oof. Cool. Yeah, so now I feel like if you had exalted it, it might actually mm. be in a decent spot here. Mm. It'd be really threatening, I think. Mm -hmm. But I in hindsight twenty twenty, you know. Um 
Which one is this? This is the Xenosaurus. Hysteria, <laughs> Call the Weaker Gone. There's a poke in there. Poke, standardized. There's an unlock gateway, key to disc at some point. Life for a life. Life for a life is a big one. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go for a, not a risk, but let's let's go with Saurian again here. Okay. Saurian it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. I am gonna deal with this Archimedes. I'm not sure if that's what you're hoping for. Uh, but we're gonna get a fight. And then a fight. Oh, it's a mandatory exalt. It's a mandatory exalt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. interesting. I feel like there's a me. So I get to look at the top three. Hand decision or brain decision on this one? Quick draw. Uh, all hand during the game. I actually can't see the. Okay. The three. Oh, uh, yeah. Oofa doofa. So we'll do. Hmm. Stop the check. I guess. Doesn't matter that much. Hand, bottom, okay. Ooh. And I'm gonna move one amber from the Shrix over here. Okay. Okay. Well, um, maybe I, I was wrong, but I probably was would have let Charette go. Or rather, I would have let Archimedes go and gotten rid of the Charette. Gotten rid of the Charette? I have a feeling that we're going hit, to get hit with a Brend life for a life here. I don't know why. But... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The reason I was thinking was that... Um, his creature control was fairly limited, and if you got rid of the charrette, you would at least make make him need to have an out of hand answer for the uh, Bracus. Hmm. Hmm. Fair enough. That's fair. But he had the answer, so you know. I don't know if the uh, creature control is limited. I guess in shadows it is. Yeah. I mean, you had the gateway, as we said, and you had a life for life. And the standardized would not have hit the Bracus. Sure. It would have hit other things that had amber on them, but not the Bracus. Mm. Um, and so, you know, there wasn't a whole lot else since your one of the culls was gone, but the cull wouldn't hit the Bracus. Mm. Um, no, so yeah. Um, I mean, see. would the dis had mattered if I had fought? Oh, because you were the killing Charette, so I could have fought with the Charette. Yeah, I see what you That's mean. what I was thinking to kill the Charette, so that you would have to have one of those mm. answers um hmm. yep. let's go with um sanctum here Oof. I just realized I stuffed up. I didn't see that card. <laughs> ah, the Faust, you mean? No, the Cleansing Wave. Ah. Uh... I put di a pinged damage, uh, damage, a pinged damage around the place. All right, so we will deal damage to 
the Shret now. Capture here. Mm. Ugh. Stop the check or let you forge at 10. Forge at mm. 10. Do it. Yeah, I feel like I kind of want you to forge at 10. We'll see if Quick Draw disagrees with me. But you come in. Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely agree with forging for 10. Mm -hmm. Even if we get unlocked here. Oh, key to this. Nice. Nice. Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah, Senator Quintilla. Quintina? Quintina? <laughs> Quintana? Quintina. Quintina, yeah. I always thought it was Quintana. Ooh. Well, that's pretty brutal right there, isn't it? P. Brutal, my guy. <laughs> P. Brutal. Uh, I don't know if there's anything we could have done about that. No. No. Just be sad. Just be sad. It's indeed it. Let's mm -hmm. go. Um, let's go dis. Okay. Go dis. Take back our relentless creeper. Gonna play the infernus. I mm. think we're just going for pips here. I don't have a good reason to take mine. No. Okay. So we'll grab your life for a life, I think. Mm -hmm. And exhume. Yep. Let the creeper comes down. And a Dexus. Which I probably should have put uh, not on a flank, but here we are. And we're going to stir and grave, I think, for the Faust. Bracchus. I guess there's a case for uh, Shrix as well. Faust may be too slow. I'm going for the Faust. We'll see if I regret that. I think you had to go for Faust. Yeah. He's checking for key three right here. You don't really have a luxury of of uh Brachus ever landing. Yeah, and I don't have much I mean there's maybe a case for Shrix instead just to get the steal. Uh Faust still has to stare down key to dis, which is unfortunate, but I'm actually gonna play this. That's cool. Question is, that like, puts me on seven fast. Uh, I'm actually going to be patient. Patient indeed. Okay. Hmm. Tricky. Yeah, this is a tricky one. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm, I can't see what's left in your deck, so give me one second to think about this one. Yeah, have it up on stream, or I can... Uh, I can Am I still uh, here? Still here. Still got you. Um. Pause in this one. Yeah, I don't know if there's a... There's a path here. Um... It just disconnected me, sorry. <laughs> All good. All good. It's saying error unfinalized track. Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh, hang, and Zencaster. Hang out on there and it'll uh it'll hopefully hopefully catch up to it. Okay, okay. Um Oh man. Uh have I mentioned that I don't like this? Um <laughs> <laughs> Let's go let's go dis. Dis it is. Interesting. No in the archives. I think we're going to make some money. That's probably all we can really do. I think so, too. Uh, Cinder comes down, captures on in Furnace, I guess. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Team TP still to come. Mm hmm. And I, I would normally say just push through it here. But I think I'm going to discard actually this implosion. Okay. Well, it is, it is to come. It is to come. It is to be. Let's let's see it. Yeah, pretty good. But uh, sadly, I will forge for third key. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Solid. Solid. I that love Night Forge in this deck. That is worth it. Night Forge, awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, would you have called this there, JT, or would you have gone to Sarian? Uh I I think we had to go I think we had to go disc there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately I think there was the only play. Yeah, I was hoping. Well, I didn't really think about the Night Forge because I don't think anyone thinks about Night Forge. But was... mm, that's my dark horse of this of this yeah, deck. It must be. <laughs> because I was often, hoping... like the team TP can set up a really big turn with mm -hmm. friend and like, ah, oh, it's last key. What are they gonna do? There's nothing to kill. Ah, oh, fine. I'll be go up high. And I'm like, well, I will team TP, and then I will Night Forge. Yeah. 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 Agreeing with the chat too. I I don't think we had a uh, much hope to play fairly from then on out. Um, it's a hard deck to play into, I think. It was. I mean, there were some interesting calls, right? Like, uh, the the TMTP was looming. The um, the kind of Brens were looming, and especially once you got the uh, once you got that key to disc online, those were extra threats. And I don't know. It felt like there were a lot of things that we just had to play into and hope that uh, either didn't land or I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know, what do you think, Quick Draw? I felt like we we just had a had to hope a lot. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, you had to hope that he didn't have the answers, and he did. Um, yeah, I mean the Archimedes. Maybe you're right. Could have done a lot of damage if you had left it stick around. Um, I was kind of just trying to play to like, you know, what is what is the best case scenario here for us, and just try to hope that that works. Mm. But I'm often scared playing against like decks with like Odoak and whatnot. Um, if I don't specifically have K to disc down, mm -hmm. because there is no easy way to get the brands off without it, them on the field and life for life. So it's like I have to. So that's one of the types of decks that I will be banning again, especially against David Papiani this week in NKFL. Will mm -hmm. be the scariest deck with his Odoak. <laughs> yeah, I I played a lot of decks couple seasons ago that definitely wanted to look out for Odoak, Discombobulator, that kind of stuff. So I, I know the feeling. Um, Clogan asked an interesting question. He's like, did the flow feel like it changed at any point in that matchup? Hmm. There were, there were things that I was very cognizant of. Um, I did feel like you you were applying pressure very early, and I don't know I don't know if if it ever changed per se, but I was very aware of it. If that makes any sense, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My I did like even I'm not trying to toot my horn. I did like the play of not <laughs> using that key to disc on that disc turn towards the end. Yeah, because I knew I had a night forge, and I'm like. I will get enough pips and shadows to do the night forge if it happens, but also I feel like if I try to go for um, the play, then I didn't have any creature control left. If you did have a bunch of Saurians with Faust, that was a really good example. I think there of like, sure, there's great value and you could check for key three, but it was in the long run not the right play to make to increase the chances of winning the match. Because if you pitch it there and then Faust comes down and you can't answer Faust right away then what right like you could be sitting here for a while until you find the creature control that you needed to get rid of the faust mm. the if it means anything sorry the thing is still saying unfinalized and finished not recording on my side oh dear well we'll, we'll check on it in a sec here um maybe we'll sign off and uh see what's up with zencaster I've had worse happen. Don't worry. That Zencaster giving us gub. I don't know. <laughs> Guff. Well, at least gub. like the gub. other one was recorded onto Twitch, so at least the content part of the thing was there. 
the the audio stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, we have that in the worst case for sure, for sure. I feel like we've had a, a couple misses uh, in a row with Zencaster. Um, yes, it's been bad. Hmm. Hmm. No, I bumped my computer and then it just blacked out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've uh, I've had some issues where like I turn my VPN on or off during the Zencaster and it messes it up. Hmm. Um, if you unplug your headset during the Zencaster, it will mess oh, it up. Really? Yep, it's uh, it's very fragile. She's a very delicate woman. Delicate. I like to see it. it gets it gets upset if you change the audio setup for sure. Yeah. Indeed. Well, we'll we'll sign off here then and uh, see what's up. We'll release everybody for sleeps. So JT, that didn't count for the the series, right? We have to actually <laughs> play your match. Yeah, this is this is a practice game. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is fun. Uh, congrats on the win. We'll record it in the official places for recording. Uh, yeah. Right on. I still have to face some um, vendetta for the last one but it means that that game at least solidified me as a equal spot with philly so okay. now it's um ben Dedder's game to try and come back into it exciting times Congrats. Exciting very nice times. let's see if he's around <clears throat> cool well uh folks who are still in the chat thanks a lot for hanging out it's a lot of fun uh and yeah thanks again astron for uh for coming on tonight so you're gonna play game two um yeah, yeah. good talk. Yeah, I had fun. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, indeed. Yeah, it's great. Cool. Thanks, folks. Chat. We'll sign off here. See you around the uh, lab.